and welcome to another American TESOL Presents Free Friday Webinars. And for this one, we actually are with the ESL Tech course. So if you're part of American TESOL, then you can actually go and have a discussion in the forum. This week's lesson, and it's free, it's free for anyone in American TESOL. But of course, you can always get a certificate of participation. You can download the slides. You can also get the resources for free. There's These are 30-minute webinars, and everyone's welcome to come. But if you come um, here, then uh, just know that with these, the slides actually end up having more resources. So the slides won't be, that I upload afterwards, aren't going to be exactly the same as the slides here because they have more. But we want to try and stick to the 30 minutes as much as possible for your sake. So uh, just letting you know. So sometimes I'll mention things and there won't be slides. Game-based learning. Well, actually, game-based learning, um, game-based language learning has existed for a very long time. And in fact, they have, oh, well, thank you, Kat. Kat says the slides have been a great resource. Woohoo! There's also bookmarks. So um, the slides also come with bookmarks. When I slide, share the slide share, if you scroll all the way to the bottom of that slide share page, you can, of course, download and save these PDFs. But the other part is you can see the transcript, and the transcript is full of all the slide information. So that's it. Just keep scrolling down the slide share, and you'll get that all, all for free. So I'm Shelly Sanchez Terrell, and right now I'm in Venezuela. So they're actually doing game based language learning too. And the great thing is that one of the people that has been pretty phenomenal and has spurred kind of this movement for game-based game -based language learning is actually going to be the keynote here, and his name is Graham Stanley. So your homework and the homework for my professors here um, that teach English language teachers um, in um, Venezuela um, is to review Graham Stanley's site, which is a Elton, um, a, an Elton winning one. And what they do is um, you'll see a lot of the lesson plans that he's created for many, many years. And Graham Stanley now is in Uruguay, but you can see every lesson plan, you're going to evaluate the lesson plan and pick one that is appropriate for your age group, for your students' English level. And the great thing is on Graham's site, you can find all of that. You can do a search and you can find all of it. And he has great lesson plans. He's played all the games. And of course, you're, one of the ways you're evaluating is you're playing the game. So this week, your homework, or I don't like to say the word homework, I like to say mission, is to play a game on Graham Stanley's site and go through the lesson plan. So it's a pretty good, I think that's a good, pretty good, um, fun way to learn about game-based education. Game-based education is different than gamification. And that's very important because if you are gamifying the curriculum, um, that doesn't mean you play a game. You don't necessarily have to play games if you gamify. Um, so we're, what we're concentrating on is actually having students play games to learn. When they play games, and we're not talking about classroom games because this is a tech course, um, but we're talking about actually playing games on the computer. There are many ways you can play games on the computer, um, but theorists and uh, people that we study in education, Piaget, um, I never say his name right, um, but um, Baduda, um, Einstein, Dr. Seuss, um, many, 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 Godfrey Ben say that the best way that we learn and there's many quotes out there, is to play. Of course, they meant playing in the playground. They meant playing in dirt. They meant playing um, games in schools. But now you do the same things. There are a lot of things that you do when you play a game. So in the chat box, if you want to start typing out 
Um, what happens when you play? What happens when you play a game in the classroom? And I'm not talking about a video game, but you can talk about video games as well. What, is, what are some of the skills you use? What are some of the things that happen? You make connections, okay, yeah. Nowadays, um, it's interesting because one, uh, games are very, very social. Um, a lot of times uh, you'll have headsets if you play a PlayStation 3 or a Wii. Um, you play against other people around the world. And in fact, they found research, they did a lot of research, and they found that millions of people learned English playing games. And the game that they played, um, a lot of businesses started hiring people who were warlocks or who were leaders in this game. Can anyone guess what that game was? This was about 10 years ago, and it was a viral game that people played. And they had, to, it was one of the first games that was on the computer that you would play with other people around the world. Can anyone guess what that one is? It was a lot like, um, a little bit like Minecraft, but there was guilds and there was, um, you could be a warlock, you could be different kinds of um, play characters. Exactly, L Lily says World of Warcraft. And millions of people learned English, and the reason they learned English was because this was the way they were going to be able to accomplish the challenges um, and achieve something when you when you played World of Warcraft. So we found it was a very very powerful motivator. So what if learning in schools was like playing a video game? Well, why would you want it to be? Uh, a lot of uh, people discount playing games, but when you think about it, if you're teaching math and you have students do page 55 or 105 in the workbook, do problems 1 through 10 or uh, 1 through 40, and you're drilling, well, you could replace that with a game. And it would be more motivational, actually. Um, and some of you said some great things about playing games. One of the things was connecting. Uh, Sharon said that there was less nervousness. That's actually very good because a lot of times when you have students and you're drilling them and you say, okay, what's you, when you have each one say out loud um, and you do, multiple, let's say you're doing multiplication tables and you say that you're doing it by 10. So you, the first student says, 1 times 10, what is that? 10. And then the next person, well, some of your students are very shy, but in a game, they might be the leaders. They may be the ones who um, take on different roles and decide that they're going to be um, a different kind of gamer because one of the things with games is you get to be a different person. You get to take on a different persona and whoever, whichever character you choose, what happens when you choose characters? You get to choose a few things. One of my favorite games is car driving games. Um, if you take a car driving game, I get to choose the car I want to have. I get to choose the color. I get to choose the track and where in the world. I even get to choose the music that comes on while I'm driving that track. So you can see that is very motivating um, because I make all of these choices and not something. I went to a great presentation from someone who has a site dedicated to language learning. And um, the site is also dedicated to um, um, having games for teens and, and other students. Um, and it's English Attack, and this is by um, a good friend, Paul Maglioni, who's based in Paris now. Um, and this is English Attack, and you'll find this in the bookmarks. I'll share the bookmarks later. But he did this great presentation um, where he had done a lot of research, and it was really interesting. Um, he's also sometimes based in Italy. He was in Italy for a long time, Paul Maglioni. And so these are some of the things um, that I've come up with, but also part of his presentation that I got. Um, and you can follow him. He's at, you can follow at English Attack or you can follow at Paul Maglioni um, on Twitter or on Facebook. You can look it up and you'll find him there. So um, one of the things that happens is it's very goal-oriented. Um, if you fail, then you keep fa failing again and again and you don't care. Students don't get depressed if they fail. They just play. Sometimes they'll play 10 hours in a row um, until they achieve that particular level. So imagine if you took your English lesson and you were trying to get them to practice grammar, how do you think 
they would do if they practiced 10 hours of grammar. They would probably be pretty good at the grammar. So um, you can see how games can be very motivating. Um, it's a multimedia explosion. What do I say? When you are looking at, thank you so much, Peggy, for sharing that, because that's the, um, the slide share Peggy shared is the one of Paul Maglioni. Um, but the great thing about it is when you have language learners in particular, even math or even types, different types of learner, and they talk about um, learners having different st strengths and whether or not you believe in learning theories, the one thing that's very important, especially if you're a language teacher, is you want your students to practice the four skills, um, listening, speaking, writing, and reading. So in a lot of games, they actually have heavy, heavy reading. Um, they don't necessarily have a lot of writing, but they do have a lot of listening. You have to listen to their characters. You see the other dialogues, and you do speaking in a lot. Like World of Warcraft, you speak to others, and you, you, know, you um, tell them what your plan is, and you work together to do something together, to complete a challenge. Um, or you, you can tell them a plan. You can say, hey, I plan on, um, in this round, I plan on um, actually... Um, go. I'll, I'll be the person that goes out ahead and, you know, gets, um, maybe I'll be the one who gets out, but I'll be the one who's in front of you and protecting you. And you can go and you can, so you can strategize together, and that's very important. Um, the great thing is that when students try and they don't achieve the level, they already know they're not going to achieve the level. They already know they're going to fail. Um, they don't. They don't think that they'll achieve the level in the first round. So they they're actually used to trying again and again. Um, it's a very colorful world. It has a lot of visuals, and for learning a language, you need that. But even when the great thing about it is, um, a lot of times, like when you teach history from a history book, the students don't get to see what that world looks like. They see every bits of pictures now and again. But it's really interesting that there's a lot of adventure games that are based on history. And so you'll be, for example, in a Roman civilization, and you'll see all the graphics, and they look like Roman civilizations. One of the most interesting things that I've ever found is um, I took art history, and I was learning about the art that is on the actual um, sarcophagus for famous um, Egyptians and stuff that passed away. And it was really interesting that in some of the games, I saw the same art. So for me, it showed me that the people who designed the games, they really try to make it sometimes representative of the world um, or, or the history. So they read the history. They read, they get, you know, um, they actually have people who will tell them about so that way they can create graphics that really look like this. Um, and then they're part of a learning journey, and I think that's one of the best things. Um, and it's also positive stress. So learning is an adventure, and learning is very stressful. For a lot of us, we may quit, but in a game, they don't want to quit. One of the big people in game-based learning and gamification is Jane McConaughey. She has a book called Reality is Broken. It's very good. I have the book. Um, but she says people don't have a propensity for laziness. In other words, a lot of times students will walk and, you know, will say, do this work in the workbook, or we want you to answer these questions, and we, they don't do it. And we think, oh, you're not doing it because you're lazy. It's actually not why they don't do it. The reason they don't do it is because um, they, they're not very... Um, they're, they're not very um, excited about it. It doesn't matter to them. It doesn't make it meaningful. So if you go away from the book and you add a game, instead of saying do the questions this time, choose a game that will teach them the same thing. And you can even assign it for something that they do after class. And if they do that, then that's going to be work that matters to them. So they'll put the 10 hours, and the reason they'll put the 10 hours is because it's work that matters to them. Um, if you told your students, what I want you to do um, as a challenge is the next time you walk into your classroom, instead of doing the typical, unless you do use games, um, go in and say, we're going to play a game. And remember that the game does have to apply to their level. So if you teach adults, it should be more like an adult game. You would be surprised. Um, who do you think is one of the leading 
the leading um, age groups that plays games. There's actually different um, ages that play games, but there's one segment of the population that is getting um, that is playing games the most. Like they're they're they they don't play the games the most yet, but they're getting there. Um, it's the fastest growing group, and it's important to know game researchers do this. And the reason why game researchers research this is because they're trying to make games for them. <laughs> and what, what gender do you think it is? Oh, Katie's getting close. <laughs> Actually, the, the, the largest growing segment of those who play games is female, 50 years old. And that's because um, if you think about Facebook, those are all games. And all your friends who invite you to Candy Crush, that is why, is because of the Candy Crush. <laughs> and it's because of Words and Friends, exactly, and Scramble, and um, the new Gem one. What is, what is that Gem one that everybody plays now? <laughs> so all of those are games as well. So you might think, hey, this is silly. I'm not going to be able to do this with my adults. But in fact, um, <laughs> these are the ones who are playing games. So there's a lot of Facebook games out there that actually would be great for that. What can games be used for? Well, you can replace it a test or a quiz. I'm not saying for every single one you have to use a game. But you can do at least one game this year. Um, you could do it to for visualization and to experience a foreign concept. So let's, for example, say that um, you're trying to get a game where you want to teach them Roman history, or maybe you're trying to teach them the politics of the country. You can actually get games um, that go back and teach that. Let's say that you want to teach them, um, you want to get them to travel to another world. You can have games that are in other worlds um, where they build things. You can have games where they build things. It's good for drilling, so instead of them doing um, quizzes and stuff in a workbook or doing uh, practice in a workbook, every once in a while throw in a game. There are a lot of language sites out there, Busu, um, there's Duolingo, there's um, English Central, there's, um, what's the other one I'm thinking of, um, uh, there, there's a bunch of them out there. Uh, that's a good question, Katie, and we're actually going to, I've got them all bookmarked, so I'll share those with you. Um, but when you have the games, um, it's really great because um, all of these sites use game based. they use gamification. Quizlet, that's the other one. Quizlet's one of my favorite one for language learners, or and learners in general. Um, and that comes as a mobile app as well. So Quizlet um, is where you can learn vocabulary. And the great thing, I, I think that's a must for every single language teacher, is to know Quizlet. Um, and you can take the vocabulary and you can make different word games with it. So uh, Quizlet is a really great way um, to do drilling of vocabulary. So if you're going to teach vocabulary and your students will thank you for it. Um, you can get it free. All of these um, are free, by the way, on uh, mobile devices. You can get it on the computer. So it does for Android, iOS. So um, they can play it wherever they are. And then also if they create games, um, then they would be really good for digital storytelling. I'm actually going to show you some preschool games because I actually had to teach two-year-olds. And the only way that I could get my um, some of my students, my four-year-olds and toddlers, to speak English around me because I'm an, um, from America, a native speaker, they wouldn't speak in front of me. They were very shy, but they knew how to speak. Um, my and they were when I was teaching in Germany. Um, and the thing is that they they wouldn't speak because um, they were shy. But when I started getting them to play games, they spoke. And I'm going to show you the game that they love. They just love this one adventure game that talked to them, and then they had to do tasks that they were talked to. Um, so the, one of the first sites that. Uh, is the Graham Stanley site that won the Elton. And this has games for all levels. Um, you can see here it's written as actual lesson plans. This is all free, by the way. You can buy their book, too, that has lots of great ideas. Um, it has more. 
Um, you have the level, which is advanced. And actually, the book is what won the Elton. I think the book and the site. The location, it tells you whether or not you need the computer room. Um, skills focus, it tells you. It even tells you the language focus and the game. If you go to the very top of their website, you're going to be able to find where you can find all these games um, by level. You can search by level. You can search by... Um, you can search by age group. You can look for preschool and search. It's at the top of their website. You'll be able to find this. The other one that's really good, and this is where I found a lot of um, this is where I found a lot of the the pre K stuff that I did was actually kindersite.org. So the kindersite it has a lot of games. It tells you the different. They have age nine to twelve. They have preschool, age six to nine. There's a lot of the Starfall games on there. Um, and it's really, 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 really good. The other one that's really good, and I don't think I actually listed it here uh, because I've mentioned it before, is the Learn English site. So if you have Learn English Kids, that's actually one of the best sites um, that I've ever seen uh, for having kids play, um, play games. And depending on the country, so I'm going to give it to you for the English one, but um, if you Google it, then you'll, it also has stories, um, it has the vocabulary, and it has printouts. So that's always good. So I always use that for my students as well. The other one that you would like to know, let's say that you teach CLIL, or Content Language Integrated Learning, then the one you want to look at is... Um, is Shepherd Software. Shepherd Software um, has a lot of language games um, and also science games and math and everything like that for students. So you can find a lot of games there. And this is for all ages as well. In fact, you see where it says pre-K, so that's really good. The other one is, um, okay, so the other thing I want to tell you, so there's different types of way teachers teach with games. You can either pick one game like World of Warcraft where you teach the whole class and the whole class uses that. The biggest one, every um, few years they have a game like that where everybody plays, it's viral, everybody loves it. Of course, the most famous one, and you can kind of see here, is what? What game would this be that this particular teacher is teaching with? And he's using it with his sixth graders, but I've known students as young as six-year-olds that play it. Exactly. Peggy got this one. <laughs> Minecraft. So some teachers actually take games, and they have one, they have students play that one game. So one that is specifically for um, language learners that does Minecraft is the ELT Sandbox. This is by David Dodson, and David Dodson actually... This is what he did his master's thesis on. So David Dodson um, has put up his experience of Minecraft. He was teaching um, young learners and children in Turkey. And so he gives you lesson plans, what they did, how they built things, the language that came about it, how he tested their grammar, and things like that. So that's in the actual ELT sandbox. Um, now, I've actually also bookmarked um, some of the kids' sites. So when I was in Croatia and I was teaching kids, I've been to 28 different countries now, and um, the kids teach me a lot about the games they play and things like that. So Minecraft is still very, very popular. Um, but one of the kids that I met in Croatia, and it was from a really great t um, teacher. It was her son, and so I got to go to her house and things like that. Um, and that was um, Mariana. Uh, Schmolsik and her son actually started teaching me about Minecraft because he has his own um, Minecraft channel. His English was perfect. In fact, um, you couldn't hear any accents. You wouldn't have known he was from. Um, you wouldn't have known he he was from Croatia. He had a very good American accent and everything. And knew almost perfect. Um, I would say pretty perfect. Very advanced. And the way he learned it was because he wanted to make his own Minecraft YouTube, and I'm going to go ahead and share that with you, because I made him a keynote speaker for one of our uh, conferences, the Reform Symposium, and he just wowed everyone. So now he's actually training teachers at, now I think he's he's 9 or 10, and he's 
um, training teachers how to use Minecraft with their students. So it's actually quite phenomenal. And he learned English through YouTube. Um, and the reason he did was looking at all the Minecraft stuff and playing Minecraft, playing Minecraft with others. You can see his YouTube videos that he made. Nobody had him do that. He didn't do that with school. And his six-year-old brother did the same. So his six-year-old brother it knows like perfect English and he learned it because of Minecraft and YouTube. So these are definitely big motivators. In the actual bookmarks, you're going to find way better um, Minecraft things than this. Unfortunately, um, I didn't put the, the right ones here. Um, but you can go to the Minecraft wiki. It's not as good as some of the other, um, the other game-based sites that I, that I have um, bookmarked for you. So I'm going to go ahead and give you just the whole collection, and then you can go to those resources, and um, you'll actually be able to find uh, different types of games um, and, and things on, on game-based learning as well. So I'm going to go ahead and give you that. And there's one on Minecraft EDU. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share with you that as well. Um, there's also game-based rubrics that I have on there and other things. So what are some of the activities they do do? Well, of course, they can play the game. But that's not enough. Enough is, I mean, they, you have to have a pre-task, post-task. It's a, What I like about Graham Stanley's site, even if you don't like all the games, is let's say you find a game. That's usually what happens is you teach with a game. And like me, you find other games that are better for your students. I was working with very young learners, four to six six-year-olds, I didn't see many that I liked um, on the site. I think they're for a little bit older. Um, but the great thing about it is that um, I, I found some on Nickelodeon that I liked. And what I said is that, uh, <laughs> that's so great, Peggy says that, um, um, that, that our student was saying that he likes creating games more than playing them, that he's the master at Minecraft. That is great. That's fantastic. <laughs> Um, but the great thing is that when they're when you're starting out with games, before you start the game process, it's good to know how to manage this. But it's also good to introduce your students to the rules and um, what they're going to be doing because that way they have kind of like a blueprint. So the first thing you can do is you can do an activity where they brainstorm. They list their favorite games that they play, and then you can think you can start from there and think of whether some of those games are free. First of all, if they play them online. Um, the other one is to see how many people play them. And if a lot of your students play them, then that could be definitely something that you'll want to teach with. And then see what you can teach with it. Like, see if it supports anything in your lesson plan. The other thing is, um, they can create their own games um, from that. And we'll see some sites where you create games. Um, the kids can create games very easily and quickly. Um, super simple, super easy. Um, they can even do it within a 45-minute lesson. Um, and then you have a rubric on how to grade them creating their own game. Um, the great thing about that is when they create their own games, then they also get to write down, like, um, they, they, they say one of the best ways to learn is to teach others. So by teaching something with their game, they're actually, in essence, learning it better. They can create what's called a walkthrough. Okay, so there's a lot of big, long games out there, and there's a lot of short games. There's mobile games, there's PlayStation 3 games, there's adventure games, there's interactive text games. There's so many different types of games. There's archive games, and so forth. So if they're doing an adventure game, they can create, they can do digital storytelling. They create a storyline because you know. Um, like World of Warcraft, Minecraft, all of those have kind of stories. They have a basis. They have where it was set in history, things like that. So they have to do the research. So that's good because they have to do research. Now your students, if they're very, very young, then um, what we're going to have is, is that maybe they won't do that. So one of the most famous ones, English learners, is this one, in fact. Um, and then you can see this is what a walkthrough is. When your students create a walkthrough, what they're saying, what they're doing is they're letting other players know how to play a game. That's what they're doing. They're, they're saying how they can play this game 
I wonder if I'm doing this correct. I hope that goes to the right place. I'm not go to the right place. I'm sorry if it doesn't. Um, yeah, that does go to the right place. Okay, so when you go there, you're gonna see what's called a walkthrough. So walkthrough is um, this is Samaros game, and um, a lot of language teachers use this. They like it. It's an adventure game that asks students to accomplish things and do things. So here is a walkthrough. It goes through each part, and what it basically does is it takes screen and next to it it says things to do while you're there so the students can always create a walkthrough for their games or you can create a walkthrough for your students games so if you're trying to go through a theme if you're trying to teach specific vocabulary if you're trying to get them um, then you're all your are you having to advance the slides today oh my gosh I'm so sorry about that I don't know why that's happening. It could be my internet. Um, but yeah, we're now on slide 14. Um, so that's oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, I think it is the bandwidth. So one of the other things when they're making a game, um, they can map out ideas. I would recommend that they work in groups or pairs to do this. Um, and then of course they can create they can create their own games. Some games you don't have to map out ideas or anything like that. I always find it good to brainstorm. I always try to take them to do five minutes or something. One of the easiest ways to do this um, is if they do something like Zondo. Zondo.com didn't exist since for a long time. They can create quiz games and phonics games. They have thousands of questions to choose from, or you can even create games for them. Um, the good thing is on Zondo you'll find lots of games. So even if you don't want to create a game, you can go to Zondo. Zondo and you can use the games that are there and that could be games you start with one of the most famous that m most kids are for that absolutely is get kahoot and unfortunately um, I oh wait no I think that's the right one okay I thought that I had not put that right uh, you can access get kahoot on any device um, so that's really good it's trivia games it's uh, there are different types of um, trivia games. Now, Zondo has like little animals and characters that are fun for little kids. But, um, and we're on slide 17. The, Zondo, I mean, Get Kahoot is really exciting because kids are placed against each other. So they have to uh, go and they have to answer a quiz. It's actually very visual. I didn't put the visual part, but you can see here. After they play the first quiz that you give them, and there's lots and lots of, um, different types and they're on a timer and they love it just play it once and you'll see that students of all ages love it now the adults um in fact eric scheniger who's at fetc was talking about get kahoot in his um one of his um presentations and he's a principal a very famous principal and he said that the reason adults like it too kids love it from all over the world i've heard that from turkey i've heard that from greece i've heard that you know venezuela kids love get Kahoot from all over the world. Um, but Eric Scheniger said adults love it too. And Sharon says in Italy too. Um, because he says it's like a pub quiz. <laughs> so even your adults will love get Kahoot. Um, so you can quiz on anything. But after they do that, they are prompted to make their own trivia quiz. So it doesn't take long for them to make a trivia quiz at all. <laughs> Sharon even gives you a good idea for it. See, Lily says her college students love it. So Get Kahoot is one of the easiest way that you can play a game. There are other more like um, back games and actually there's the Internet Archive that recently came out that has a bunch of different games that you can play. Um, that's a lot like Carmen San Diego. Um, they have also the Oregon Trail, these kind of old games. Um, the Internet Archive has come and, and really gotten um, so you can play those games. So I'm going to put that link actually inside um, that you can put it for there too. Another site is classtools.net will allow you to make different archive type of games. So that's what made me think of this one it's because um, classtools.net is made by um, a teacher in Toulouse, France, um, Russell Tarr, who's also fantastic to follow because he makes so many great things for teachers. So classtools.net, you can find lots of things 
Um, you even can make uh, one of the things that's really famous on there. You have to have good bandwidth for this, by the way, because um, I, when I've been on there, it takes a lot of my bandwidth. But um, it's good if you do because you can create all kinds of stuff, including it has a fake. It's got fake book. It's like Facebook, but it's fake book. And it's where you can make a Facebook for different characters um, around the world, famous characters and things like that. So you can do that. Stencil.com, another one um, to make games. I haven't done it too much, so I don't know. I know Get Kahoot is really good. But the reason I put this is because it also has templates. I think templates are good because when you want to go really fast, your students, I'm going to show you one that's really good called Scratch. But that's if you have time and you can take the time and teach your students. Um, but if you want them to create games really fast, get Kahoot, Stencil.com, Zondo, um, you can do pretty quickly. Um, because they have templates, they give them ideas and so much things. This one, you know, they have role playing, aliens. And what do you what's one of the best ways to learn languages? Role playing. So so this is the Scratch one. Scratch has many rubrics, it has many lesson plans, it has where you can do all these things. They have so many different things. Um, one of the things here was a very simple game where they could go and they could um, click on the different words and it would actually make a sound. There's also adventure games. You can make adventure games if your students work together in Paris. This could be a big project. It could be a project that kind of culminates or takes everything you learn throughout the year and they put it in this game. They can put they can contextualize the text or visualize what they learn. And I always say the great thing about games is that um, it places students in that world. So a lot of times when you have language learners, the reason they don't grasp the concepts or the language or um, the history or what they're learning is because they are not in the actual context. Um, they're not in that setting. And they can't even imagine that setting because some of these settings you, you are very different. Um, a Western world like this, they didn't have any electricity, some of them. They didn't have, you know, they had candles. They didn't even have phones. Kids can't imagine the world without phones or mobiles or the internet. So for them, um, it's good to make a game and for them to start choosing characters. They have to choose what kind of technology would have really been there. They have to study the landscape. They have to study the fashion. What did they wear? They have to study maybe the newspapers. Um, they can go through the archives and look and see what people look like, how they dressed, how they spoke, because the English is very different. Did Are they going to have in the dialogue, if they have an adventure game, are they going to have the words LOL? Um, no, they're not. So these are things that they can uh, really pay attention to. Text Adventures is interactive fiction. That's a new type. This one is very reading and writing oriented. Um, interactive text means that what you do is it's the game starts already for you and you can play some of these. I find them very difficult. I don't really like them, but there's a lot of teachers who love them especially for English language learners. So what happens is that um, it starts you off and then you have to write in what you would do. Or you write in and it's called interactive fiction and it's a game. There's serendipity. Man, I put a lot of them. And then there's two apps that I really, really think are wonderful. Now, one of the ones, and you can play this with preschool. You find tons of games for preschool. All of these games are free is Tiny Tap. That is one of my favorite ones. Um, it has sounds. Um, you can learn different languages as well. So if you don't only teach, then you can do that as well. Tiny Tap is for Android and it's for iOS. They just recently told me that they came out with an Android um, just right, um, this version already. Tiny Tap has tons of games that you can have access to and your students can play. And I had teachers um, test it out, and a lot of really young learners love Tiny Tap. Um, they, the, you can have preschool, and they'll love it. But even older, so they can actually create very good. They have twenty different soundtracks. They can um, make it very colorful. They can add their own pictures. They can actually upload their own pictures um, to do all of this. Um, and they have little effects like. On this one, if you guess it right, um, I'm learning, you know, Spanish because I'm in Venezuela. If I guess it right, 
if I get the vocabulary right and it speaks it to me so I can add sound as well um, then balloons come down because that means that it got it right so I think that's really cool game press is one of those where you can make a game and this is a little bit more in depth so this would probably be for um, older learners maybe teenagers even middle school um, their English might have to be a little bit more intermediate, high intermediate, and advanced. Um, with Tiny Tap, they can be beginners. It doesn't matter. It has drag and drop, um, and it has real physics. So if you're teaching CLIL, if you're teaching physics and math, then it has that incorporated as well. You can even import your own graphics and things like that. One of the things I used to do with my students, and this was back in 2004, is my students didn't create these type of games, but they would create and paper games and instead of having pop quizzes and quizzes um, they would actually make crossword puzzles and stuff and they would take the vocabulary because they hated taking vocabulary quizzes and they weren't using the vocabulary right after the quizzes um, they they would use it in a paper and it was wrong the way they would use it so instead I started getting them to make games and what they did was they had to take each other's games now they made the game at home like for example the crossword puzzle and when it came to class they had to give it to another student and the other student took that game and then the student uh, who made the game would actually grade it and then um, that's what they would get so um, and, and we would have rubrics and stuff to make sure that it wasn't hard and if I thought that it was too hard or there was any flaw in the game making um, then of course I gave extra points for that and we talked about that so these are definitely, they loved it, um, and I, um, they, they learned the English much better. They did much live? better in their tests. Oh, sorry, yeah. I still have done a uh, tiny thing there. Okay, so sorry. <laughs> That's what was the tiny tab. I didn't mean to put the tiny tab there. <laughs> it's in the background asking me where I live. Uh, <laughs> Here's a rubric that kind of tells you it's a scratch project rubric. They have a lot of rubrics on there. And then I put a lot of different game-based rubrics and rubrics you can use for grading. So you might say, well, how do I grade what they play in a game? Well, it depends. Um, if you're doing drilling, then you don't have to. It's just the practice, um, and it'll help them for the quiz. Um, but a good thing is that when they have it, um, y when they are making a game or something like that, then you can use the rubric to go ahead and um, to do it. Um, you can embed most games in wikis. You can embed it inside um, your own uh, Wix site. Um, you can put it in your Moodle course. There's a lot of Moodle games too. There's pronunciation games in Moodle. So you can take the games and then embed them somewhere. Put a link in there. And then here, like you can kind of see in this one uh, with my adults, um, I would usually show them a video and then I would put something at the end. I would do that with my young language learners too. I don't know why I didn't put that one there, but let me go ahead and give you um, that one was called English Storytime and you'll find games for preschool there as well. You'll see it by theme and then you'll see the game that they had to play as well. So when you're starting a game, I would urge you do something simple, one of the easy games. Just take one of the lesson plans from Graham Stanley's site. That's why it's there, so you can use it for free. You don't even have to give them any credit. You don't have to tell your students that's what it is. Um, but what you can do is you can take it, and then you can use it with your students. Um, and then, you know, you can try it out and test it out, one that you think is appropriate. And then afterwards, ask them for their feedback. Ask them, you know, did they have fun? Did they find that it was interesting? You can compare. Um, what I did was I compared how my students did in the previous vocabulary exams, because it was the same ones before and then after. And I found um, my students, I actually, it was really amazing. I was teaching language learners, high school learners. They were beginners, and they would start with me in high school um, in Texas, and then they would graduate. All of them passed the SAT, um, and, and so the school was very impressed. They said that was the best of the language. It was about 75 or 80, and the great thing about it was because they, I found that when I did things that were fun and um, fun and motivating for them, they worked harder, they played more, they, 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 they were... Um, helping each other a lot and it wasn't just only games but games was a part of it and I found that when I did things that they enjoyed the learning then guess what they would 
they would do better in the task because they were learning more and they would remember it. Um, one thing that Jane McGonagall says in her book, she says, the games are an extraordinary way to tap into your most heroic qualities. And I think that's really true. For my students, um, they didn't feel like they were failing so much. Um, they didn't look at it as failing. They looked at it as we're going to keep trying until we get it right. Um, and it's really hard to learn a language. It's really hard to learn and try and take tasks, whether they're taking the A outs, whether they're taking um, the TOEFL, the TEFL, you know, whatever they're taking, um, the SAT, or even their other English tasks. It's really difficult for them. And if they can just advance and get to the level and feel they achieve something like a game, then they'll do really good. Um, I'll give you this bookmarks at the end, but thank you so much, and if you, we will see you next week uh, again, and thank you. Um, you'll see the slides and everything. Um, I'll try to go ahead. Oh, thank you, Peggy. Put the Leslie already. She's awesome. <laughs> um, and then we'll see you next week, so thank you so much.